Sorry, Chloe. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, we are recording it, by the way. So, you know, on the record. <laughs> I don't know how to toggle it. How to behave. Yep, now, now it's time to behave, now that it's recorded. <laughs> I don't have to hit record, right? No, I, I got it. I'm good. I like the new raise hand thing. <clears throat> All right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we've got just a few more to join us. Four, five. Doesn't Liz Barrett kind of look like Candace <laughs> in the picture? Uh, one of our former employees. Uh, yes, actually, yes. She could be a sister for sure. Emily, so we got Liz. All right, hang tight everyone. We'll get started here in just a second. Where are you, Toronto? Are you at your house? I'm at work, I'm at the office, yeah. Did you put like smart books behind you so people think you're smart? <laughs> oh, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> awesome. No, I'm gonna put on a list. Hi Liz from Chicago, going. thanks for being on. L. Christy, Melrose is still here. Uh, Rachel, excellent. Thanks for being on. Thanks for being on time, everybody. Really appreciate it. We just have a couple more people that we'd like to wait for. So that aren't on time. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. I'll let Marissa behind the scenes let me know when it's time to roll. <clears throat> I haven't had either one of these other wines, so I'm pretty excited about it. I haven't had the Estate Cuvée in probably five years. Wow. Yeah, I haven't had the 17 in a while. That's awesome. It's going to be a purple teeth thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. When this eye gets lazy and I have purple teeth, that's when you you just cut my feet off. And it's done. You yeah. black out. It's just no longer with us. No video. Just no video. That's just that's grass. <laughs> oh. okay. I can control myself. So I think maybe at 135, we'll probably just kind of hit the ground running. Um, but I know we've got notices out going to the others. What do you have, Eric? Last crasher. I'll look at you. Just <laughs> that is so unsavory. Oh, okay. I was itchy. Better and better. It, it was itchy. There's nothing wrong with that. Can't you just scratch it with your hand? Do you, do you need a tool? Back here, you can't, I can't get it because remember, I don't have use of my left arm. So back here. All right. We're getting the, the uh, green light to go. So we're going to go. And so, okay, everybody, uh, thank you so much for joining for this uh, virtual meet. meet media visit sorry i haven't even had a glass of wine yet uh and we really appreciate you being here uh to learn a little bit more about uh Paso Robles wine country um big thank you to two in communications out in new york who have put this uh together for us uh we're able to showcase for you a, a bit of the personality if you will of uh, Paso Robles wine country that's what we hear often actually uh is when people come to visit or they're see some of our producers uh, out in market they're they're always commenting about this camaraderie that we have and so that's why we've titled this one won't you be my neighbor and you'll see why there's a lot of neighborly stuff and as you can see already with everybody giving each other uh, a little 
ribs and pokes on some things. Uh, we've got some good rapport here uh, amongst our, our panelists. Um, I want to remind everybody, though, uh, that uh, you can taste throughout this webinar. You don't have to wait uh, for a wine to be presented. Please enjoy. You can go through the lineup however you like. Uh, obviously, we're going to be going in an order eventually of the White Rhone style uh, blend first, then over to the Estate Cuvée of La Venture, and then over to my favorite neighbor uh, from Booker. Uh, but again, please enjoy. You don't have to wait on us uh, to get to that. As you can see, many of the panelists, including myself, will be sipping along as we go. Uh, and also, uh, I'd like to remind you, though, that we are recording. So, so you know, we're recording this. So even though that came out already, just in case somebody joined late, this is being recorded. So that's about it. All right. Any, anyway, let's get on with everything here. Um, I, first, I do want to introduce everybody. We've got Chloe Aceo Fabre from Laventure Winery. Say hello, Chloe. Hello. Oh, Rich Hartenberger with Midnight Cellars. Hey, Rich. And Benson with uh, Booker Wines and My Favorite Neighbor. Uh, all proprietors, winemakers, people that mm -hmm. have been involved in, in uh, uh, the, the, their respective brands for quite some time. Uh, Chloe, I know you were actually, we were actually expecting to have Stefan, uh, Chloe's father, on, but Chloe, Chloe's sitting in. Chloe, can you give yes. us a shout out? My, my dad had to uh, get an operation uh, last minute, and so he is recovering slowly, and he could not talk with you guys today. So I'm here instead, but I speak better English, so <laughs> at least you'll be able to understand me. Way better looking, and she brushes her teeth. Thank so. you, Eric. I appreciate it. All true. All true. Thank you. So, so we met Stefan, but uh, all all wishes to his speedy recovery yeah. there in France. And so please wish him our best. I will, but he says hello, and he's sorry Good. he wasn't able to make it. Excellent. Virtually. Thank you. Uh, all right. So getting into this, Paso Robles is known as a small town. We're pretty tiny little community here, um, especially in the wine community. Uh, everyone knows everyone. This comes in handy when, say, a pump or piece of equipment fails in the middle of a long day, sorting fruit uh, or, or something of the sort. And so having a neighbor come to the rescue mm -hmm. is the difference between a complete work stoppage and, say, keeping the juice flowing. These three producers, and are, are quite literally neighbors, by the way, um, they all coexist with their brands and have somehow worked or collaborated or simply a glass or two together over the last 25 years. Uh, and so th this is why we have uh, chosen them. Uh, we've got Rich and Eric Jensen, who basically are on the same road, Anderson Road, and they're making something of it. And I encourage them to talk a little bit about that later on in, in our webinar here. Uh, but they they exist on the same road. I know that they've done some things here and there together, and they're currently working on a big project for beautification on that road, as I mentioned. And then we've got La Venture Winery, whose property basically butts up right against the back of uh, the Booker property. Uh, and so again, neighbors and, and things passing through fences and down the road and you name it, this, this is what this community is all about. And so speaking of community and speaking of neighborliness and on all of these things that uh, kind of showcase uh, who we are as a region, um, I think that there is a lot of advantages, of course, right, to being or having this community environment. And to kick it off, I'd love Eric. Eric, if you would talk a little bit about this community involvement, there's so many great aspects of what makes Paso so unique and, and the community part always seems to shine through. The light that's going down on the top of your bald hat is like blinding me right now. Do you have a baseball hat or anything? Yes. Like, yeah. my <laughs> You're just starting strong. Well, you guys are seeing that my light was bad. Uh, <laughs> No, you know what's funny, Chris? Uh, for the press, for those of you that haven't been here, you never want to say, hey, it's just better. It, it's, just, it, it's just different. And the real difference, people like to say, well, we're what Napa was 30 years ago, blah, blah, blah. I don't know that there's any truth to that. We're like anybody ever was. I think we're the first pass out. I remember tasting with Richie 20... I don't know, 25 years ago in the tasting room as a visitor. 
like, yeah. man, one day, and he goes, hey, let me know however I can help you. And then as luck would have it, we bought at the end of the road. And we had little babies and we needed a babysitter. So Stefan on the backside immediately became my, 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 my mentor as a viticulturist and, and winemaking trainer as did Justin Smith. And, and, and not to say that I didn't learn a lot from Richie as well, but we put a gate in. So his daughter uh, could babysit the kids. I think she was only 11, but she looked like she was 18. So I was cool with it. My wife wasn't. But I was our, that. Yeah. she was our first babysitter. And anytime I would harvest in those early days, if a tractor went down, a trailer went down for either Bob and Sherry Booker, we tried to harvest on opposite days so we could share our equipment, our tractors. And Richie, once I started making wine, immediately is where I pressed all my whites at. And immediately became where, oh shit, Rich, I got an emergency. Can I process three tons of red? You couldn't do it at Lava Insurance. The fun is the lumpiest. I mean, during harvest, you don't even want to talk to them. He's going better. Well, yeah, he's gotten better. Over the better. years. <laughs> he's gotten old. Uh, or, uh, I'm almost the same age. But it was so funny. I'd pick up the phone and Richie just came to expect it. And boom, he would, yep, bring it over. You got the two o'clock time slot. We'll get you in. And Stefan and me, geez, you would have thought we owned each other's tractors because it was nonstop. And then at the end of the day, I'd have to drive all his equipment back so he could pick the next day. And then at the end of that day, he'd come back. So, and then me and Richie ended up buying a tractor on the road to share with all the neighbors because we all thought we'd need just an excess tractor. It was just, that was just past you didn't, you didn't, the, the word no didn't exist. It was always, okay, how can I help? And that really embodied what we did in those early days. And Would you say of, though, those early days still kind of exist to some extent with all of you? I mean, I, maybe not the three of you, but when you look at the greater community, there's still new brands, there's still people getting started. Um, Chloe, you're you're shaking, you're nodding your head. Are you still seeing this kind of uh, helping others along with and pulling them definitely. along? Definitely. Oh, definitely. And I think even more so, it, it's neat to see, like you said, all the newcomers uh, and the you know that older versus newer generation helping each other and being also a lot of mentors, not just you know giving tractors or you know handing a hand, but also mentoring, giving advice. Um, I think you see it even more so today. And then you see it also, not just production wise, but between tasting rooms, you know, we're always recommending uh, each other. There's no competition, uh, which I think is the beauty of Paso in general. Yeah, and I know it, as we see new brands actually establishing, many of them have to have some form of an incubator, whether they start off over at Lavin and later on become close to Lynn or Ben Benam or, or, or whatever it might be, or with Eric, with you, maybe with other brands also that have gone on. Rich currently also has that happening um, under your roof, right, Rich? And you're seeing new brands kind of pop up uh, and, and find their way, at least establishing themselves for a short while under your roof. Talk a little bit about that. For sure. Absolutely. We do a... Uh... Uh, a lot of custom work for a lot of people on a lot of different levels. Uh, like Eric mentioned, uh, I have one of the only bladder presses over here on the west side. So everybody kind of brings me their whites and we press them. Uh, quick turn and burn stuff. Uh, we do processing. We have the the, all the two pretty sorting tables. Uh, so we do a lot of just sort and, and another uh, kind of a turn and burn uh, where we just sort people's fruit and they take it away. And then we also have... Uh, uh, several, uh, several uh, really small projects uh, that people bring to us and we are start to finish. So we bring it in as grapes. We do all the processing, the two table sorting. We do the pressing, the barreling. We do the barrel upkeep, uh, wine upkeep and get it into the bottle for them. So uh, yeah, we've got probably 15 customers that we do that kind of work for. Um, so it keeps us busy, but it keeps us also in touch with, you know, kind of what's happening in the area and uh, it's super fun. Like when people come in and they just don't, 
this, this is going to sound bad, uh, when they just really need a hand and they don't actually have the same knowledge that someone that's been doing this for a while has. That was pretty delicately put, right? Um, it, it, it's, it's nice to see people be appreciative and, you know, we try to steer people the right way, people to, people to buy from, people not to buy from, uh, experiences that we've had. So we see a lot of different grapes every year, so it's, it's also good for us. Uh, so we get to learn a lot about new vineyards too, because the vineyards are constantly changing hands, wineries are popping up. Uh, so it's, it, it's a, it's a two way street and it's really kind of fun. Yeah. Is there any disadvantage from this tight knit community? You know how they say like, you know, you can't sneeze funny, you know, in a, in a small town. Uh, what, what do you guys think, Eric? No, cause you hold each other accountable. Uh, and you, 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 you kind of just do like the charity auction we just had there. You know, we raised over a million grape. It was, it was shaming people and then giving back to the community that they've profited from, and and making sure that issues here get our attention. That we take care of those that can't help themselves, um, or areas that are lacking, and people that deserve more. And so, no, I mean, my wife would tell you it sucks because you know. If the three of us walk in a restaurant, you know, we're going to hug 71 people. And it drives my wife nuts because she thinks it's date night and it ends up being party night. So inevitably, we don't go out too much together because, as we all know, you walk into any restaurant here. But that's it. And Richie didn't explain. He doesn't just do custom crush, nor did Stefan. They actually help people get going yeah it's custom crush on richie's end a little bit but they always end up on their own he trains them he doesn't he undercharges he barely charges and stefan has done that with a number of people as have i we don't have that proprietary there's a secret shit going on here it's how can i help you get better we get better all of us get better. we make pasto better yeah. Mm -hmm. Which ends up helping all of us. Yeah. No. Let's, uh, let's take a moment to do a little bit of the origin story. We've already had one question about where the name Midnight Sellers comes from, but why don't we do a quick little, give us the background of how the brand started uh, type of, of story. Rich, why don't you go first with the name and, and a little bit of your background? <laughs> Yeah, well, our story is kind of different than a lot of people's. Um, I grew up in the Chicago area, uh, went to University of Illinois. White Sox. This is That's our fun. year. It's our year. Um, my folks uh, like got transferred to L.A. to uh, my dad's job. He was a patent attorney in the medical supply business. Um, uh, my wife and I used to travel to San Francisco. My folks would pick us up in San, Fran in San Francisco. We do Napa. So no, that was our mecca. That was where... It all started and I had to make a, I won't say drunk because we were driving. I was a tipsy comment to my dad, you know, old man, when you retire, why don't you buy us a winery like this uh, and we'll run for you. You could be a gentleman farmer. Uh, we all laughed about it. A couple of years later, my dad called me up and said, well, they're forcing me to retire early. Give me a, a decent sum of money to do so. Are you serious about this winery thing? And I'm like, no, no, I wasn't and neither were you you're drunk too. <laughs> uh, but then after a while, you know, we're sitting in Chicago, we we're young kids, um, 26, 27 year old kids. And I kept saying to my wife currently still, which is amazing. Um, you know, how cool does it sound to chuck it all as a 28 year old now, uh, and move to California and to start a winery. So we did, uh, we sold our house. Uh, we just fixed up for ourselves. Uh, we sold one of our cars, drove out to California and we started this crazy thing. Um, the name Midnight Cellars came from my dad. Uh, our last name is Hartenberger, uh, which is a mouthful. Uh, I was living with it for my 55 years, almost 56. Um, is You have to spell it for everybody. It sounds German. It's not especially appetizing in the wine business. So my dad had the idea that he wanted a wine or a name for the winery that was dark, romantic, mysterious sounding. Uh, so Midnight Cellars became, uh, became our name. Uh, it turned out pretty well for us. People seemed to like it. It gave us a whole, like an astro astronomical motif for the wines and the names for all that. So uh, we we put up with our midnight auto supply jokes at the beginning, and we had kind of a weird 
witchy following for a little bit, but that seems to have kind of tapered off. Um, <laughs> so here we are, you know, we, uh, we moved out here in 95, planted our grapes spring of 96. Uh, so this was our 26th year in business, but we made it this far um, and it's been a blast and it's been just a great place to be. We're growing, uh, raising kids and uh, having neighbors like these guys. Uh, Eric has his moments, but he's also one of the most fun people in the whole world to hang out with, as is Stefan. Um, I, I, there's stories about my 40th uh, birthday that I, I won't tell here, but that was a nutty, nutty night. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Rich. Chloe, would you give us uh, the, the quick background on Laventure? Yes, so we are originally from France, and uh, my dad was actually making wine in Bordeaux before we started making wine in Paso. So he's been making wine for almost 40 years now, um, adds up. Uh, but he was tired of the restrictions in France, wanted to have more freedom with making wine. And so uh, my parents sold everything in France and went out on a new adventure, hence the name L'Aventure, uh, to find a beautiful terroir piece of land. Uh, in California, and uh, they fell in love with Paso Robles in 1998, where it was a wild, wild west, like uh, my dad would say, but he loved that. And uh, he fell in love with what is now L'Aventure, and that's how the story started back in 1998. So, and we're still here and still going strong. Yeah, and you and your background, why don't you share a little bit with that? Because now you're working at the winery, but that wasn't your first uh, career calling. No, 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 no. I uh, actually, yeah, I, I didn't study to make wine. I didn't, uh, even though my dad will always say, you know, I was born in the barrels. Uh, obviously, I wasn't, I reassure you. But uh, no, I actually um, yeah, studied uh, fashion and I was planning on uh, following my dreams, either in New York or in uh, Paris, but uh, I met a boy who was in the wine industry and my dad just, you know, handed the carrot. He was waiting for the right moment because he always wanted me to take over uh, and uh, bring what he calls the blah, blah, blah of uh, the company, which is the whole marketing part. And so... <laughs> offered me a position I couldn't resist. And I've been with the family business now for seven years. Uh, today, I'm proud to say that I've taken even more responsibility and now manage the winery uh, so that my dad can enjoy, uh, you know, sipping uh, sangrias in Spain if he's not here in Paso. And uh, yeah, I actually love it. I That's great finally realize what it is to be, you know, in the wine industry and making wine, which is not so easy. Got to be passionate. And before we segue to Eric, I'll say uh, with the, the Aseo and then the Fabre family, uh, they've made quite the impact on Paso with a restaurant owned by Stefan's son, Chloe's brother, Julian, called Les Petit Canai, uh, which is uh, definitely a hub for uh, a, a lot of uh, those kinds of nights that Eric was describing when he you tried to go out for a date night and you actually run into everybody in town. Uh, um, and then also other brands like Close Lynn and uh, Binom that uh, are brands that are, are related in, in a sense. Yeah. Uh, it's like they, they call themselves their little French, Paso French Mafia or something. French but, Mafia, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eric uh, with Booker. So it's Booker and it's my favorite neighbor. Yeah, I was at LPC Friday, uh, Chloe, and Thursday I snuck out at midnight when the Magnums came out, and uh, I did not want to chip in for the Magnum of Salon that was pulled out uh, or anything else, so I went out the back door and uh, oh. asked Bobby Fox to meet me around the side and meet me right on. Uh, yeah, 40 bottles I had already had was plenty. Uh, I was in the concert business. Got tired of it. We sold the company for very little money. Didn't know what our next move was going to be. Uh, packed it up, moved the whole family. I had two little, a one and a, you know, one and a half and seven months old uh, baby. And just said, F it. We're going out to Pass Robles. We loved it out here. We got married out here. And like the Aseos, it was a new adventure, like the Heart Murders, new adventure. And you'll, you'll, you'll notice that's kind of the theme of Paso. It's, it's an area for dreamers that were in the restaurant business that 
or just an attorney, but not, not very few people here came here rich. We've got two new rich guys, but the bulk of it, this community did not have any money when they came. They scratched nickels together. There's probably 50 American dream stories here. You can just throw a dart and pick any of them. When I found the piece of property, I bought it from the Booker Trust. It was me and uh, uh, Justin Smith, who I made wine with at Saxon. And right when we pulled in, we both looked at each other and shook our head. We knew right away it was across the street from Richie and butted up on the backside to love it. Sure. And I heard all these stories about the orphan Booker brothers that never married. They were, you know, they loaned everybody their equipment when a, when a husband would get cancer or take ill and pass, they would farm the widow's land, uh, bring in a sack of money once they sold the crops, set it on the table. They were really past Lord Templeton's best friends. And when they died, they gave everything to charity. Um, and while they were alive, they really were the supporting team for anything youth, boys and girls club, the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, they loved kids um, and they loved their neighbors. So I thought I would honor their name, even though they weren't drinkers or great growers and keep their name alive and name it Booker. Uh, then I started a Cabernet called My Favorite Neighbor in 2006. That's me and Stefan, a little cartoon. There is a picture of Stefan, but because I am a loser, I forgot it. I've been texting to try to get it here and no one could find it where it's his face on it. Uh, and that was the 2016 uh, label, but that was me and him always fighting. I was the worst pupil he'd ever had. I disagreed with everything and I had no no, you know, no leg to stand on, no justification, but I think I just like to fight with him and watch him get all red and he always had leaves in his hair. And when I wanted to make an homage while I'm doing Cab, Petit Bordeaux, and Syrah, I wanted to make the homage after a state cuvee. And the name was simple because every time he would call me, it would be Stefano And to this day, it's always been that. And I just thought, I, there was no thought in the name that was always going to be my favorite neighbor. Oddly enough, and I'll close with this, the name really shouldn't be owned by me. It's really a community name because when you go to Tin City, when, when you go to Justin Smith at Saxon and how he's helped Legend Turtle Rock, when you go to Stefan and how he helped uh, uh, Guillaume and me and Richie has helped so many it really has become a theme line for our area of helping each other and wanting success out of everybody. I'm, you know, we all are mentoring other younger people in other tasting rooms, etc. So it's really become a name that passed. So I, I should, you know, forfeit the name because it, it really embodies our spirit. So those are how I came up. Yeah. I love that. That's, I mean, it's so neat to, to know that my favorite neighbor is kind of this homage to Stefan, not only by placing his name or, or in that cartoon caricature, uh, the relationship that you guys had, but also the fact that it was uh, kind of almost, uh, you know, made after the state cuvee, which is one of the wines that uh, we have on offer today. Uh, and so thank you for walking us through how my favorite neighbor actually got its name and everything. That was actually going to be one of my follow-up questions. I'd love to go into the fact that we sent some gifty items and I want to talk a little bit about why. Why did you pick what you picked? Chloe, I think I'll start with you. You picked mm -hmm. some some handcrafted salami that is local. Yes. So obviously, you know, salami as a French person, uh, it's like bread and butter and cheese. They just go hand in hand. So I thought it was fitting, but more importantly, where it's coming from, it's uh, some Arepia, which is actually from Antonio, who's a very good friend of the family. He was actually one of the first people that uh, we met when we moved. And, you know, he welcomed my parents with open arms and invited uh, them for dinner and for lunch. And uh, he was already very much part of the community. He still is. He's very, you know, involved. He has two restaurants, one in Paso and one in San Sebastián. 
So I just thought it was very fitting for what we're talking about today. Yeah, yeah. and and the alopecia uh, salami, I'll tell you, there's a, a lot of different uh, flavors, if you will, uh, but all locally made uh, and just a really a good, strong local presence in amongst all of the wineries in town, but you can even find it in the local grocery store. I mean, they are just doing so well for themselves uh, after uh, being born out of a restaurant, right? Weren't they, didn't they kind of come out of Bonatavola? Yeah. 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 A local Italian restaurant. Eric, Eto Pasta. This is another one of these items that has blown up over time recently. Uh, I mean, I know for, for, for me, I always have Eto at home, uh, handy and ready available. My kids love the stuff. What inspired you to pick that? Well, my wife can eat it. She's gluten-free, so it's made of seed. Uh, it, you know, it's Brian Teresa, who's another wine guy. It's, we're, almost a, we're almost a biodynamic community. That we're on this self-sustaining loop, you know. You got Antonio, who owns an unbelievable... Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> an unbelievable Italian restaurant and he sees a niche so he makes a salami and it's off the hook you got uh, Brian Teresi who is a wine guy but he's a food guy because we're all food guys I know Richie Person is, is, is a great chef and it, you know and you go over to the sales house and it's a shit show there's like nine people in the, uh, in the kitchen bread everybody's got a set job and they're just focus and we're almost on a closed loop here most of our kids grew up doing 4-h most of our kids have raised animals done the whole gamut most of us have done that and so with edo it was just you know it's brian he's a wine guy that didn't make a mediocre dog shit pasta he made a badass pasta that's now used in restaurants you can be uh, we all dig and eat and we're foodies so there's nobody cutting any you know there's there's no free rides here your restaurant opens up in town and sucks we ain't gone even if it's you know julian's restaurant sucked we wouldn't be there but it didn't suck it's incredible and that was incredible and his wine guys so for me it's close to my heart because i love brian and his wines are totally the opposite of mine and i him and i like him and his wife awesome that's great uh, purposefully saving you for last, Rich, because you're also going to be the first wine that we're going to uh, talk a little bit about. Uh, but uh, what's interesting, so everybody, I've, I've, I've been in that kitchen there behind uh, Richie on some of these meals that he's gone crazy about. He'll bring ribs from Chicago or fly out lobsters from Maine and just have this big, giant feast of a meal. And he's a great chef. And he picked a spice to uh, talk about today. Uh, well, great chef. I appreciate both of you saying that, but that is not the case. I can take food from A to B, and I like to have parties. So let's just leave it there. Um, <laughs> basically, that, one of the big things about Paso Robles that I wanted to make a point of is that most of us are family businesses. We're owned by families that we actually do this for a living. This is how we feed our kids. This is how we send our kids to college. This is how we survive in society. So we try to, uh, I have always made it that point um, um, to support small family businesses or big family businesses, as long as it's a family involved. So Spice of Life is a, a little place downtown, um, downtown Paso, it's near the backyard, which is also another fun little family business where you can drink all sorts of beers and get in, get in trouble and have your wife tell you it's time to go. And, <laughs> Um, so this was the, uh, the one that we chose was the lemon pepper, uh, classic. Cause it has, it's just, it's more than just a lemon pepper. It's pretty deep and complex in what all the ingredients that, uh, the lady, I can't, oh, I can't think of it. I know. I can't think of it either. We all shop there. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't think of her name, but she's a wonderful lady. <laughs> and, uh, this, this thing is so versatile. It goes on fish. It goes on pasta. It goes on uh, poultry. It goes on just about everything. And I just thought that was kind of what be a fun little, uh, thing to toss into the mix. Yeah. And now go on a little bit about the Aurora. Okay. So the Aurora. is uh, my version, my take on a Rhone style white. Um, I started making this wine in 04 
after trying the Tablas Creek uh, Spree de Blanc uh, that Neil Collins makes. And as is the reason why I have 20 wines in our lineup right now is because when my folks were alive, the reason why we got in this business is we loved going wine tasting. We loved partying. We loved tasting what other people do. Small family businesses, again, focus on, but we also did the big boys. Uh, so we went to Thomas Creek and we tried that Esprit de Blanc back in 03. And I was like, we have to try to do something like this. I mean, Neil Collins, in my opinion, is the best white, white wine maker in the area. Um, but I just figured I would do this wine. And, you know, it's just been one of our top selling wines now. It's just, I don't make a lot of it. I make 100, 100 to 150 cases a year. Uh, I try to get as many of the board or the Bordeaux, <laughs> uh, the Rhone white varietals in it. Uh, Marsan, I just haven't been able to find a reliable supplier for that. So this one has v, uh, Grenache Blanc, Viognier, Pic Pool Blanc, and a little bit of Roussin from Carl down the street, uh, who's also a neighbor on Anderson Road. Um, and uh, the Viognier portion of it is from Four Lanterns, which is right across the street in the same, you know, our West Side neighborhood. So. Um, we try to keep everything uh, small uh, so I can keep track of it. I'm getting older, so it's not as easy. Uh, so I'm trying to hire more people to do more things for me. <laughs> uh, but this wine has been one of my favorites uh, year to year. It's not as good as the Talbot's Creek. It's <laughs> really <laughs> but it's up there, darn it. I'm trying it. And one of these years, man, I'm going to get it. Uh, but it's a cool, it's a super cool wine. Uh, we do it all in French Oak, but uh, very little new. Um, uh, and we do it all in barrel, so we do it pretty traditionally made. We hand harvest, we whole cluster press, barrel ferment, age surly, uh, and we're bottling it younger and younger. So we're bottling it now in February or March, so four to six months uh, after we make it, just to keep it fresh and get it in that bottle as fast as we can. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Chloe, what do you think of this wine? Super nice. Nice acidity, balanced, uh, and I'm very picky about my whites, so no, bravo. It's, uh, I like it a lot. I've been sipping on it. I'm done with my glass, so <laughs> that's a good sign. I'll take that as a compliment, basically. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, a wonderful wine. I'll, I'll admit uh, from my home standpoint, this, this wine actually is a white wine. It's my wife's favorite wine in town. Uh, white wine, this is, this is her go-to. She pick. drinks a lot of it. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you were sipping on this wine too. Love your thoughts on this one. Did you say Eric? Yes. Oh, it's, it's a great wine. It's, you know, to me, it's a hipster wine. Because uh, I'm still this. I'm creating a wine very similar. So my story will be I tasted Rich's Aurora and said, I'm going after that. And Rich is right. It's the fun of what we do. And this wine's balanced. It's got great acid. It's definitely, you can tell it's a West Side made wine. Yeah. I'm not going to get into that reasoning why. I just get a lot of beautiful minerality out of it that I would get off the soils we have here. But it's interesting, you know. Uh, we all make Chardonnay. And, you know, listen, a great white wine is great. A great Chardonnay is great. But, you know, it's, it's a knock in the head. It's over and over and over. And this is fresh and I like that Richie's trying to move up the bottle in and keep it fresh uh, because that's the way the Espr Esprit Mo Castell is. It's it's a fresh made wine. They're not trying to make a heavy wine. And, and even though my palate skews textural, I love hipster whites. I love the the you know the Shannon Blancs of the world, but I really love the Rhodes of the world because that's what I do. I love Grenox Blanc. I, Richie, instead of Marsan, go look for some Claret launches. It's not as big and massive, but it, it fits this wine gorgeously. But the, yeah, this is just easy. I like that it's in a screw cap because you can just pop it. I'm getting really tired of cork because I'm getting really effing tired of TCA. And I'm moving some of my bottling to this because we now have 20 years of data. And so, yeah, cheers, Richie. Great job. Awesome. Yes. Well done, Rich. Uh, let's uh, get on to the next wine. Chloe, we're going to taste the Estate Cuvée, which uh, it's the 17. 
also Willow Creek District. I should have mentioned uh, the Aurora, although I don't think it's on the label, uh, but I think most of that fruit is Willow Creek District, and then your home ranch is on the is in the Willow Creek District as well. Right. Uh, most of this is um, part of the GB is from Adelaida, and part of it is from El Pomar. Okay. So there we go. We have three districts actually then represented in right. that. Uh, and happy to go into more detail, although I think uh, much of the material that we provided to all of you has a little bit of what the AVAs are all about in, in Paso. But uh, it's uh, with Rich's Wine, it actually crosses many boundaries of being up in the Adelaide District, Willow Creek, and then also into the El Pomar. So awesome. Uh, Chloe, back to you in the Estate Cuvée. So the Estate Cuvée is our top cuvee. It's the king of the vineyard, if we can say that. Uh, and it goes back to the beginning. Um, this is the reason why my father wanted to leave Bordeaux, was to make this crazy blend, which ironically today, it's not so crazy. I think a lot of wineries have adopted this blend, but it's a Syrah Cabernet Sauvignon and Petit Verdot blend, which obviously he couldn't do in Bordeaux. Uh, but uh, it was his fantasy, as he likes to describe it. And uh, for him, it was important to always start the Estate Cuvée as being a... Uh, oh, we have our... The same winemaker just popping by. Hi, Patrick. Uh, but uh, it was important for him to always make this blend estate. So since we purchased the land in 1998, we didn't start, you know planting and making fruits or getting some fruit from it 2001 2002 so that was actually the first ever vintage we ever did of it and then slowly but surely as we became more and more estate the estate cuvee really took on that role of being our flagship wine so in terms of texture length depth complexity uh, it is really a, a step above and it's really the cherry picking of our grapes. So it's um, a wine that can age, obviously. Uh, however, I will say, you know, our goal is always to make wines that you can enjoy now, like you can enjoy in 20 plus years. And for the Estate Cuvée, that's what we can say, 20 plus years so far. Um, but uh, it represents us and who we are and my dad's philosophy. Yeah. And the 17, just so you know a little about that particular vintage, it's a very approachable vintage. And I think, you know, Rich and Eric can also attest to that, the fact that it's a vintage with a lot of freshness. Uh, and for us, you really have more of that approachable factor, which usually the estate cuvee is one that needs to lay a little bit. Uh, but the 17, right off the bat, was beautiful uh, and enjoyable to drink right away, so. A very, very delicious wine, full of mouth and just, yeah, absolutely a, a true uh, kind of reflection of Paso and, and our terroir. Richie, you're sitting there mulling that wine over and I know you- I'm, just, I'm so happy to be drinking this right now. <laughs> it's been like five or six years since I've had it and it just, it's always been one of my favorites. And as is, you know, Stefan, I'm really sorry he couldn't be here. You're awesome, uh, Chloe, but- uh, okay. I know I'm not my dad. <laughs> Stefan is truly one of the greatest people on earth. He's so fun to party with, and he's just such a great person just to be with. Uh, so I'm sorry he couldn't be here with us, but yeah, this wine has always been, like when you guys started making it, the first time I ever tried it, it's just like, it's got so much going on. Even the 17, which uh, you're describing as being a little bit lighter and ready to go. This is a powerhouse wine. This is extracted but and compared structured. to the 18, though. Oh, but I haven't even had the 18. That's what I'm saying. But this wine is just beautiful start to finish. Uh, and you could put this with so, so many different foods. Any kind of a heavy, even like a hard uh, spice barbecue, you could have a blast with this wine. It's so wonderfully balanced. It's so perfectly made as Stefano has always, his wines, you can always tell that somebody that knows what they're doing made this wine. Like sometimes you drink a wine, and even, even my own, you drink it and you're like, meh, that's good. But obviously this guy isn't super sophisticated, but this is a sophisticated wine uh, top to bottom. I just love it. Um, another just an excellent wine from Laboratory. Thank you. Yeah. And something I, I should add very quickly is, you know, I think he'd get mad if I didn't say it. 
is he he left Bordeaux to make Paso wines. So he didn't leave Bordeaux to make Bordeaux wines in Paso. He made uh, he's making Paso wines, and he's proud of that. And so the estate cuvee, I mean, like Rich said, it's it's the representation of what Paso can offer. Badass. Or what we can offer. So badass wine. Thank you, Eric. Sipping on this wine, and then even getting into your own wine, uh, just some quick thoughts and then let's chat about my favorite neighbor. Well, my favorite neighbor should have gone second. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I didn't want to go guy, guy, girl. I really, the, uh, the guy, estate, girl, guy. The estate coupe, I intentionally made my favorite neighbor, even though it's the homage to this, a little bit lighter and less extracted because I didn't want to disrespect my mentor. This is massively extracted, so polished, and it always is. I just, it's like clockwork, this wine. And, and by the way, Chloe's, uh, I don't know what she's talking about, 17. 17 really separated Paso from the rest of the U.S. because the, the 17s up north, unfortunately, it was a disaster because the whole state was had 108 degree weather from September 1 to September 10. And then that followed in Napa with the fires. And so they, they basically had no wine. And what they did have was rough because they were forced to pick. The fact that we were able to get through those 10 days was a miracle in, in 17. And then it cooled in and we were able to, our color was able to come back because you deplete color in that kind of heat. Your anthocyanins, your color goes down. Most of us held on and were able to make these fairly badass wines. But, you know, this wine at 17, 18, it doesn't even matter. It's just, it's the model of Paso consistency. It's not for the shy. It, it's my style of wine, which is why I chose it as one of my guys, because it is so textural, so dense, so big. Um, and you know, they do make more elegant wines. This is their, this, this is the wine. This wine lasts for 30 years. I've tasted this wine, their oldest vintages. And it's, I mean, it's, it's still like it's five years old. And I think her dad has gotten a lot better over the last five or six vintages at making it drink right off the bat. Cause I think he still had a little of that Bordelais mentality. Like it's gotta age, it's gotta age. And then he finally realized my wine's going to age no matter what I do. And to taste the last five, six, seven vintages of this and be able to drink them immediately, he gets so mad. It, it comes over and he looks around for older vintages and they're all smoke. <laughs> I always, he usually writes on, you know, save till. And, uh, but they're just fucking so delicious immediately now. So it's like, whatever, say what you want, Richard. Let's do your wine. You ain't the boss of me. Uh, so my favorite neighbor was created in this same exact fashion. But when I created it, I very respectfully to him because he was a, such a close friend, but also he had that fatherly figure that'll never go away. And I wanted to, so I said, what do I do if I want the homage to be like a state command? So I thought, why don't I make it opulent like that? But let's make it to where if it's on a by the glass at a quorum and pour, like a Capitol Grill or a Ruth Chris who do higher end wines, why don't I make it to where it, it's approachable immediately? It's not so big and that's kind of what we've stuck with. There's no right or wrong in how you make your wine. I make a Grenache that I don't want to be big and colorful. I want it to be light and elegant. Uh, but then I also make Syrah that's massive. So with this wine, I'm really not trying to make it uh, we, very big. We use a lot of science with it uh, because it is a project I'm growing on the west side, like Richie. I am in the Adelaide. I am all up and down Vineyard Drive. And then on this side, which that's Willow too, but I am in the Gap. And uh, 
So yeah, I want this wine to touch your palate and be immediately accessible, not overwhelm you. I never want my tannins out of balance. Tannins are that drying sensation you get that the French used to lie in the British press and say, y'all, you need time. Uh, you need to age it. All three of us are making wine for you to drink tomorrow and age for 20, 25 years. And we've all, I think, proven that. And, and so that's this wine. This wine is, it, it's supposed to be a middle level between a ridge Cabernet, which is very acidic, and a, a state cuvee or an insignia from Joseph Phelps. I want to be in the middle and still be opulent, textural, and beautiful. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's my favorite name. That's great. Richie, you were sipping on this one? I am. I'm going to be hammered by the time my wife gets home and she's going to be so unhappy with me. Because I'm not letting any of these go to waste. I'm not drinking them all tonight. I'm, please, I wouldn't do that. Uh, but this wine, yeah, Eric, you nailed this one. Uh, I, I, I just think it's wonderful. Uh, it's got every characteristic you're looking for in a cab, uh, cab blend. Um, it tastes like cab, which is one of my personal things that I shoot for is a varietal correctness. Uh, my cab should, I try make it taste like cab. My Syrah tastes like Syrah. Schnozberries taste like Schnozberries kind of a thing. Uh, but this is a killer wine uh, at the price point. Uh, you're going to kill with this, obviously, because you kill with everything. Um, but this uh, truly, this is a really, really enjoyable wine. I love it. Chloe, uh, I want your impressions, but I also want to know. But it ain't no estate Stefan, What did Stefan say? What did when he got a hold of my favorite neighbor? Like, what was what was his impression when he first started tasting these wines? Uh, well, I mean, first he was very touched, you know. And I think for the whole family, it's safe to say, you know, this wine it's it's close to our hearts because the story behind it is it's extremely special. Um, but, uh, you know, if he's talking to Eric, he will say the uh, same thing. I, I, it's a great honor because it's a beautiful wine and that I've already heard my dad say it. Uh, it's super enjoyable. And uh, I think it's a great representation of what Eric was trying to say, which is, yes, you have the components of our optimist or estate cuvee, which is that crazy blend of what my, you know, dad is known for. Uh, but with Eric's touch, um, I personally am amazed by how enjoyable the 2018 is right away. It's incredible. Eric, uh, good job, huh? <laughs> awesome. So carrying on with the collaborative kind of and community spirit, looking into the future and well and actually looking at it now and into the future how do you think this community aspect that we have here in paso lends itself to say innovation kind of moving forward and make to making better wines and to making and growing better grapes well i know personally i mentor probably 20 young guys and i know one guy I I, I've collaborated with for a long time is Chloe's brother-in-law, Guillaume, from Close Saloon. Um, for us, I think Paso's finally waking up to what we have, and it's always going to be our style, and it's always going to be renegade. There's, there's always going to be, you know, Richie's and, and, and me and Stefan's, but I think that people understand that, hey, we're not somebody's punching bag anymore. We're not just growing production grapes to get bought up and sent up to Napa in their large bottlings. We're scoring with them. We're not pricing with them, which really separates us. People keep pushing us, hey, up your prices. It's like, yeah, we like to be sold out of our wines. We don't, we're, we're pretty, all of us are pretty comfortable where we're at, but innovation is something massive at Booker. And I know that every one of my friends is in the vineyard is picking up on it and they're open. I mean, like I said, Guillaume and me are on the phone weekly and, and I, I got 10, 10 city kids that I'm telling how to run ratios and analysis on uh, uh, rapid uh, phenolic data, 
which isn't manipulation. It's just looking and understanding what you have and where you're at. Hey, this is where I am at. Should I turn the heat up, turn it down? All these things we never had and all these water tools because we are in such a drought, desert, Mediterranean climate. We're all pushing these things and people are eating it up. They're accepting it. And Chloe's nodding because Chloe, Stefan was on the cutting edge of vineyard technology 20 years ago. So we are innovators. Um, everybody's starting to go biodynamic and organic. Um, that's a big push with all of us. My neighbors around me, except one, are all organic and, and most of them biodynamic. And so I think we're leading the way when it comes to that. Now, do we have the finances behind us, the billionaires that make it, Richie hit it on the nose and it's just, I got the chills and I got them again now. These are family run estates, right? These, the kids grew up in barrels, in barrels. Nobody had two nickels to rub together. Richie lived in a freaking modular. Chloe lived in a modular and I lived in a modular. And we all did. Justin Smith, Chris Cherry, we all lived in these dirty modular homes. Not more even cool, they were all dirty. And we were just trying to keep up with the kids, the bills, and that's the difference here. We're not moving in with $2 billion and putting it into an estate that, to make it look beautiful and charge $800 bucks for the bottle. We're putting it back into our community, and we're putting it into our ranches and innovation and our winemaking. I'll shut up. <laughs> it's well said. I did kind of want to add something in there. Number one, I did not live in a modular. I lived in a 120-year-old farmhouse, which is not anywhere near as nice as a modular. <laughs> I thought it was a modular. It was haunted, too. Isn't it haunted? Yeah. Uh, we're not talking about that anymore. Uh, but I also wanted to make a point that, you know, uh, Eric and Stefan and I, we came in as kind of a second wave of people. And I know Eric and Stefan and myself, we spend our hours tirelessly promoting Paso Robles, not necessarily just our own brands. So I'm sitting here and I'm writing down other people that need to be acknowledged as the early ambassadors of Paso that took the area, the, the, the neighborship of Paso Robles as serious as we do now, because we're carrying forward with uh, Gary Everly, Justin Baldwin, Art Norman, God rest his soul, what an awesome hurt person that he was. Doug Beckett, Toby, uh, Toby James. Those people spent their whole professional careers, not only building their own business, but building Paso for us uh, yep. Yep. to kind of take over. So here we are now, we're kind of the second generation of those. Now we're old school, which sucks because I used to be fun and young, but now I'm just an old bitter man. I used to live in an old house. <laughs> um, but we're, we're here to carry on uh, Paso Robles and hand it to the next generation. I know that sounds hokey, but uh, where I'm hoping, and I know that they will, that the next generation of kids that come through, they'll have that same kind of a passion for just Paso Robles and not just about all about ourselves uh, that we had. They were buying, I mean, I've been doing this for 26 years now. Um, and all I've done, when I go out on the road, I at least take 15 to 20 minutes out of every presentation I do, every wine dinner I do, and talk about how awesome Paso is. And if you're just sit in your house in Oklahoma City, you're not gonna taste half of Paso. So you have to come to Paso Robles to taste us because there's so many little guys and there's so many young kids that are just starting out and they're making pretty cool stuff. Um, so I can't tell people enough that it's all about coming to Paso Robles, not just drinking Midnight Cellars wine in Oklahoma City. Um, so I think that's a really important part of how Paso, when we started this um, in 95, Midnight Cellars was the 29th winery in Paso. Now there's what, 200, 250, 300 wineries here. 250. Uh, 250 wineries here. So, uh, and I'm uh, 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 horrifyingly so at 8,000 cases, one of the bigger guys that actually distributes outside the area. But if you like Midnight Cellars, or you like Booker, or you like uh, uh, La Ventura, you got to come to Paso because there's much smaller, there's 500 case guys here making some pretty fun stuff. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I spend a lot of time promoting Paso, just like our, uh, all these guys, all awesome people and awesome 
partiers, by the way. I farted with each and every one of them. Um, but it's, it's all about having fun in this business. And these guys had fun. We're having fun. And we hope that we can continue that to the younger generation. Speaking of younger generation, we have a question. Uh, and, and once we go through that question, I got a lightning round kind of one answer questions for you before wow. we wrap things up. I will encourage everybody watching, though, that if you do have a question, please throw it into the chat and we'll get to it and we'll stay late if we have to to, to answer those questions. Uh, but I do have like a, a one question type of lightning round coming up. But before that, Chloe, you are second generation. Uh, and so you're in the family biz. Uh, but the question is, is Rich or Eric, do you have kids that are already interested in the business? Uh, my daughter, probably, because she's a bit of a partier. Uh, my son is who I uh, graciously call the nice one. He doesn't party so hard, but he is a chem guy. I'm taking him down to San Diego State uh, tomorrow uh, to get his chem degree. So I'm hoping we can mold him into something in the business is right. Uh, for me, uh, like Chloe, Genevieve, my 17 year old, 18 in December, uh, who has babysat for Chloe now as a second generation Chloe babysat her. <laughs> uh, she is the face of the winery. I made her take the summer off because uh, it's her really last summer uh, before college. And she's the face, she's the hostess. There's no pro, she understands the computer system. Like Chloe, Chloe was an old soul as a child. We always knew that. And we always kind of figured she or hoped she would leave fashion and come back and run La Venture, me and her parents and, and my wife when we would talk. And it's happened and she'll take it to levels Stefan could have never taken it to. And uh, Vivi would take this winer to levels I could have never dreamed of taking it to. She's an old soul. Max worked for the brand this summer in New York, repping the brand. And so he spent the summer in East Village and working in Westchester, Manhattan, everywhere, all the boroughs. And Jake graduated from college and he was supposed to start a job in September. And I said, uh, you're not sitting around this summer. You need to learn to be personable. So he has always worked in the vineyard because he's a quiet kid. He's a lot like Joe, more cerebral. Unfortunately, parties a lot harder than Joe. And he started in the winery, uh, serving in the taste room. And he's making so much money and having so much fun that he is temporarily putting a September job off and moving into the finance department of Boca because he's got a finance degree to run analysis for us and, and look at different SKUs and what the new trends are with these new consumers. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, and work in the finance, with the finance team. And so all three are involved. Awesome. That's great. I didn't know that. That's that's really cool to know. Okay, let's do lightning round. We're, we're coming up on the end here. Uh, in one word, how would you describe the culture and community of PASO? And so, Chloe, go. Uh, diversity, I think. Diversity. Uh, yeah, I think it's the word just because you have all different types of people who are here, who've come here from different backgrounds, even though the goal, the end goal is usually the same. Yeah, I think uh, we have a pretty diverse group of people in this yeah. community. Eric? Eric? Sharing. I use the word non-competitive, but makes you sound like a loser. We do <laughs> not, we do not compete. No. We understand that nobody opens the same bottle every night and I've never been in a community in my life. I'm not just saying that because I, I'm in mean, that all the time. Nobody's afraid to tell anybody what they do and everybody promotes everybody because we yeah. understand and, and we genuinely, for the most part, like everybody, so. And then Richie, one word. Uh, to go further than, one step further than Eric, I would call it coopetition because uh, we do cooperate. We are obviously trying to run our own businesses. Midnight Sellers is obviously better than everybody else, uh, certainly. Um, but we do try to be nice to everybody else, like the lower links and all that. Uh, so coopetition is the word that we've been using for that. <laughs> awesome. Back to a one word uh, answer, and then we're going to wrap things up. Paso wine, the wine itself. 
I need a one word, <laughs> Chloe, I won't call on you first. <laughs> the why- No, but it's technically, I could use the same word, but go ahead. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Texture. Eric, go ahead. Texture. Texture, got it. Richie. Distinctive. Yeah, distinctive. Uh, Chloe. Blends. Blends. Go with blends. Yeah. Pass the blends. I want hers, I want Chloe's. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I don't see any other questions coming through. Uh, so I think what we're going to do is wrap this up. We've been on for an hour, actually about an hour. Oh, wait, we did have one. Love the candid chat. Oh, cool. Right on. Great comment. Thank you so much, Christy, for that. Uh, and so let's call it a day. Cheers, everyone. Thank you for being on. Thank for, you. Uh, media visit. Thank you again to Tuin. But thank you, Eric, Rich, Chloe, so much. On, and also all of our best uh, to Stefan and a speedy recovery. Yeah. Appreciate it. Indeed. I will pass it on. Thank Cheers, you. Cheers everyone. We'll see you Bye. later.